class. I'm so sad that we can't be together this week, um, but I wanted to go ahead and put together a video because we have a fun activity that I don't want you to miss out on um, that we were going to do during class. So I have given your moms all of the information that they need um, for you to do this activity. So we'll talk about it in a little bit um, when we talk about the Vikings. But I hope that you've been practicing your physical timeline and I hope that you are working hard on memorizing them. After we come back to co-op, we will be having a chance to show what you know, a chance for you to show how many of these motions you have learned and how you remember them. So I hope you're watching the YouTube video um, that I uploaded to practice. Or if you're not watching the video, I hope that you're practicing um, with someone at home. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. This week is week 14. Can you believe we're in 14 weeks into co-op and our learning? Um, so this week we learned about the Vikings and their families, their homes, and their faith. We learned about Methodius and Cyril. They were the missionaries to the Slavs. And we learned about Alfred the Great, who was the king of England. Um, I have already put those motions in the physical timeline, but at the end of each of these sections, I'll show you the motion. For it. So, um, first we will start with the Vikings, um, their families, their homes, and their faiths. Now, we learned about the Vikings last week. We learned, um, well, the last time we were together. We only talked briefly about them, but we learned that they were um, some of the fiercest warriors out there. We learned that because of where they lived, um, they didn't have a lot of resources available to them. We learned that they had to travel in order to get what they needed. And unfortunately, in their travels, instead of trading, they robbed and killed um, basically anyone who got in their path. Do you remember their favorite targets were the churches or the monasteries? Um, and so they would go in and they would take everything um, that they could and they would often kill the people that they came across, and if they didn't kill them, they would take them as their slaves. Um, so we learned that the Vikings had a really rough side, but it was really neat this week to see um, the family part of their lives and how hard they worked for everything. Um, so let's talk about the Vikings this week, their families. First of all, we know they lived together. Um, a lot of people in one giant house. Do you remember what it's called? It's a long house. They lived in a long house. And that's what your activity is going to be this week. You're going to um, design your own long house. They lived together in a giant house. It could be up to 246 feet long and as short as 49 feet long. And it could be as wide as 23 feet and as wide at two, like a smaller size would be 16 feet. So the biggest size it could be would be about 23 feet, which is me four and a half times. Okay, so picture me standing on my head stacked up or laying down um, with my feet at my head four and a half times. If you're almost as tall as me, then it would probably be about five, five and a half, maybe six of you. Um, it would be that wide. And then the thing that amazed me the most was the average one was 100 feet. But I did some more digging and I learned that they could be up to 246 feet long. Do you know that that is 49 of me? 49. Can you imagine building a house that long to fit your entire family? Now that house that long, I mean, that that's doable, but can you imagine fitting your entire family? Whew, that would be a lot. So we learned that they lived together in um, family groups and they were very self-sufficient. They met all of their own needs, um, which means that they didn't have a store like down the road. They couldn't just hop in the car and go to Walmart and get what they forgot for a recipe. Um, they had to make everything that they needed. 
they had to make their own clothes, which means they had to get the material to do that. Well, how do you get material? Like, I get material. If I need to make something, I go to the store and I tell them how much of what color and what kind of fabric I want and I make it. But they would go to the, they would go to the store. They would go to the barn and shear a sheep and then take the wool and they'd wash it and they'd cart it and then they'd spin it and then they'd weave it or knit it. Can you imagine how much work that would be? That's just for clothes. Just for clothes. Um, <clears throat> then for their food. I mean, they had to get all of their own food. So they had, they were farmers, they raised animals, they hunted, and they gathered. That is a lot of work. And we learned that it's so much work that they only ate two meals a day. Because can you imagine having to do that for three meals a day? <clears throat> um, they lived in communities. And in those communities, they had people that had different jobs, which is really the way a community, community is meant to be. They had craftsmen, so they had people who did leather work. Um, they had people who did, um, did woodworking. They had people who um, designed glass. They used bones and antlers to carve into beautiful things or into tools. They had blacksmithing. Um, when they weren't working, we learned that they played, and they played in their family. You know, they couldn't just sit down and watch TV. Um, so they played games, um, board games. They I they played chess, and they did dice games. Um, they had horse fights, which I have a really hard time picturing what a horse fight looks like. I don't really want to, but they did. They had horse fights. They made ice skates. Um, our Archaeologists, I couldn't think of the word, archaeologists have found remnants of actual um, bone, bones carved into narrow skates um, that um, they could use. Um, they did riddle, riddles, they trained dogs, they did juggling, and storytelling. So now, why do you think they had so much entertainment if life was so hard for them? I mean... You would think, we talked about you can either thrive or survive, and when you're thriving is when you have time for entertainment, but when you're surviving, there's not so much time for entertainment. But we know that the Vikings lived in the far north. They lived in the Scandinavian region, um, and it was a really cold place. And so during the winter months, they had lots of extra time to sit around the fire and do these things, because there wasn't a whole lot of going outside. So... Your activity for this week is to design a long house. Notice long, a long house. I sent um, this so your mom could print it off. You don't have to print this off and tape it together if you don't want to. You can just take three pieces of paper and tape it together. Um, but what I want you to do is to design a long house for your family, okay? So your family would be your dad's family because when a woman got married, she went with her husband back to his family. And so <clears throat> it would be a house that would include your grandparents, your dad and his family. So your dad and mom and your siblings. Also, it would include your dad's brothers and sisters and their kids. So your aunts and uncles and cousins. Um, so you need to fit them all in. I also gave this piece of paper that gives instructions um, for how to do the activity, and it gives an example of the way peop um, the way a longhouse might have been. It also gives you different ideas of things you can put in. For example, if you were really wealthy and you were a Viking, you might have separate rooms for things like food storage or stables. You might even have a bathroom, which is really just a code for an inside pit toilet. Um, or, and you would have firewood stored in your house. But if you weren't some of the wealthiest, then you just had one giant room. But what I want you to do is take this piece of paper and figure out how to fit everything that your family might need. Don't forget anything. Because when you bring it in in class, we're going to talk about what might be missing. Okay? Do you have enough food? Do you have enough firewood? Do you have enough beds? Is everybody going to fit? Are there places to sit? Are there places to store things? Where are you going to the bathroom? Okay, so bring this and we'll talk about it next week um, for the next week when we're all together. <clears throat> Let's see, what else do we have here? 
I was fascinated to hear some of the words that we have inherited from the Viking um, language, the Old Norse language. Um, the words that we have in our um, in our English language that came from the Old Norse language were anger, hell, ugly, weak, skull, and slaughter. Now, that sounds a lot like the Vikings, who were the plunderers and the pillagers, who went off and stole and robbed and murdered. But we also have some fun ones that I had that I wasn't aware of: cake which who could live without cake, freckles, husband, and wife. All of those words came from the Viking language. <clears throat> so we also learned about um, their faith. We learned that they didn't know Jesus, um, which is kind of obvious by their behavior. Um, we learned that they believed in mythical gods. Um, if you've ever watched any of the Avengers movies, you will know um, that Thor and and Asgard and Odin, Asgard is a place, um, Valhalla is also a place, those are all parts of the um, Viking mythology. Um, their travels did bring them in contact with Christians, though, which I think it might be. Well, it is how God brought Christianity to the Vikings. Because if I was a Christian missionary, I would be really afraid to go into a Viking village and tell them about God. Because they were some pretty fierce people. Um, but because they traveled and they had a tendency to attack the churches, um, God used that. Um, I know that... In my reading, I learned that many of the slaves that they brought back were Christians who introduced them. And actually, another cool thing was that when Vikings um, brought slaves back, they actually became a part of their community. Um, they often married the other Vikings. Um, they became a part of the Viking community. So they weren't just slaves in the sense of, you do all of my work um, and I treat you horribly. Um, it was more along the lines of, we're bringing you back to make our community larger and stronger. Um, and so those people were often um, able to share Christ with them. But then <clears throat> missionaries also came to them. And so they ended up learning about Christ, um, which I believe freed them from um, their hard lifestyle. Okay, so the next... Oh, and so the Vikings, do you remember, we've been doing the motions, and actually right now I'm having a hard time remembering, but we know that the Vikings, they would um, go and they would kill and they would steal. Oh, they would sneak in. So we sneak, tiptoe, sneak. And then they would steal, or no, they would kill, and then kill, and then they would run away. That's how um, we remember the Vikings, by sneaking in, Killing the people who are in their way, stealing things, and then running with what they've taken. All right, so the next people we learned about were Methodius and Cyril. They were missionaries to the Slavs. Now, we've talked about the difference between a missionary and a pastor. A missionary is supposed to go and what? Tell the gospel, okay? So we're supposed to go and tell. Well, Siri. Cyril and Methodius were missionaries who went to the Slavic nations. Um, <clears throat> and so this came because the Moravian king, Rostislav, he was worried about his country. Um, they kept being attacked by um, the surrounding country, the Bulgars. Um, and instead of preparing for war with an army, he prepared his people. How? Do you remember? He believed that the gospel of Christ could do more than an army to bring peace to his country. So what did he do? He sent out word and said, send me your missionaries. Missionaries, come. Come and teach my people about God. Teach my people about how Jesus has saved us from our sins and how we can be made new. Um, and so what, what were they supposed to do? They heard, and they had previously been missionaries with the people in that region. And so they went back. And they went, so they go, and they tell 
but they realized that it had to go past going and telling because how were people going to know what they were saying was true when they couldn't learn it for themselves all they could do was listen to what cyril and um, methodius said and so they decided to go and tell but the people couldn't read their scripture and you know why they couldn't read because they didn't have a written language so think about little kids they know how to speak our language, right? They can speak English, but they can't write it. And so the only language they understand is the language that is spoken to them. And that was the same for these people. So what Methodius and Cyril did was they decided to translate the Bible. Oh, wait, you can't translate if there's no written language. So not only did they take the Bible and, tr and put it into words, but they had to create a written language for these people, which means they created an entire alphabet and they assigned all of the sounds that the language made to different letters and then they figured out how to form them together and they made it a language that these people could read. Isn't that amazing? And what that gave them was God's Word. I mean, it gave them everything that they needed to know about God, <clears throat> at least that was written at the time. So they gave them a written language um, so that the Slavs were no longer dependent on Methodius and Cyril in order to share God's word. That way they knew that they could, um, they could leave the gospel with those people and they would be able to share it with others. Um, so our motion for Cyril and Methodius is really similar to our other motion for missionary. It's to go and te tell, but then we pause and we have to tell by writing, okay? So we're going to go, tell, and then, oh, we gotta write. And I'm frozen. Okay, I think I'm moving again. Still frozen. Okay, I think. Okay, I think we might be moving again. Yes. No. All right, I hope that wasn't too terrible, but it looked like we had a pause in the video. So we're going to talk about Alfred the Great now. He was the king of England. Um, and we know the story is he was the youngest of five boys in his family. And he won a contest that his mom decided to use to motivate her boys to learn. She said, whoever learns to read the fastest of all of you will be given a book. Which, for us, might not seem quite as exciting. Because I'm guessing at your house right now you have maybe hundreds of books. We have so many books in our house, um, but back then that wasn't common. They didn't have a printing press, so any book that came out was written, okay? So <clears throat> he won the contest, even though he was the youngest of all the boys, and he learned to read first. Um, and we know that he used what he learned um, for the good. So at 22 years old, he became the king of Wessex, which is one of the regions um <clears throat> in England and he he was a good king but his biggest challenge was the Vikings the Vikings came and attacked his community over and over and over um, it took lots of hard work um, lots of fighting but he managed to stop the Viking raids um, and was eventually recognized by all of the English people as the king not just the region of Wessex. They were so thankful that he was able to stop the Vikings, which he did in some really tricky, um, creative ways. Um, but he managed to stop them that all of the people of England called him king. He was brave, we know, and he was incredibly bold. He snuck into the enemy's camp. Um, his victories came from spying and strength, um, but also from encouraging the Vikings to become Christians. Um, but what do we learn, like, beyond this? As a king, what made him great besides conquering the Vikings? Um, there are a few things. One, he created common laws. Common laws are laws that all of the people in England would have been able to recognize. 
Um, and so it kind of gave all of the people in England something common, something that they shared together, the common laws. And what did he base those common laws on? Anybody remember? The Ten Commandments. Um, and I tell you, you can't really go wrong when you base your laws on what God's Word says. Um, he protected the poor. Um, he helped the needy. In fact, he gave one-eighth. So if you divided all of the revenue, all of the wealth from his kingdom every year into eight pieces, he gave one of those eight pieces um, to the poor and the needy, which is incredible because back then it was more like a survival of the fittest. Um, so he helped the needy with an eighth of, the, of his um, earnings. He also gave an eighth of his earnings to education. So you see his early... Um, interest in reading and education that his mom encouraged. Go moms. Um, <clears throat> an eighth of that money from his kingdom. So he gave one eighth to the needy and he gave one eighth to um, education because he felt it was so important. And he was really disturbed because after the Vikings had attacked, the people in England were really just trying to survive and they kind of stopped um, putting an emphasis on education for their children. And so he didn't like that. He wanted that to increase. And so he said, I see a need and I'm going to help um, to fulfill it. Um, he also translated the four Gospels of the New Testament into the language of his people. Well, that's ambitious. <clears throat> so he made it so that they could read the New Testament. And why would it be important to read the New Testament? The Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We know the Old Testament, right? The law and the prophets and the judges. Um, we we know all of that. But the Gospels tell us about Jesus. And the Gospels explain how Jesus died and he sets us free from our sins. So by putting the New Testament in a language that his people could read, it was like sharing the hope that Jesus has for us. Um, he also created a written history of his people. And so he really formed he really shaped England into, like, by bringing them together, by increasing education, by taking care of the needy, um, by offering hope in the, um, in the New Testament Gospels. He really helped to shape England, okay? So our motion, oh, I'm trying to remember what it is, is I think this is England. Um, so he shaped England shaped frozen England and I can tell I'm freezing again so I'm going to stop but I hope to see you guys um, next week if I can't see you next week um, make sure you get your um, longhouse done and Yes, I'll see you later.